This is Happiness Solved with America's Happiness Coach, Sandy Scarlatta. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I am so happy you're here. Happiness Solved is dedicated to giving you content that is empowering, motivational, inspirational, and of course, a dose of happiness. It's my way to give back to the world and share other people's stories and wisdom. This thing called life can be challenging, and the stories that, that are shared demonstrate that no matter what you have gone through, you can choose happiness. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to talk to you about shifting your perspective. This is so important because there are so many things that frustrate us or stress us out. And if we were able to shift our perspective of the situation, we would be so much happier. You see, we all have our own perspective which is the way we view the world. It's like the lens in which we see things. When we shift our perspective, it changes our perception of life. Our perception is the way we think about or understand someone or something, and it is also what we understand or interpret from our five senses. However, our perception is shaped by our past experiences, feelings, and thoughts. Think of it as looking at the glass half full or half empty. In short, when we change our perspective, it changes our perception, which in turn changes our beliefs and ultimately changes our reality. So change your perspective, change your life. It sounds simple, yet it can be very challenging for some to actually achieve. If you would like to learn more about this topic and how to work with me personally, please visit sandyscarlotta.com to schedule a free 15-minute call with me and to get access to a free digital copy of my book, Happiness Solved. I also invite you to join my growing community by texting me at 703-420-3472 to receive daily inspirational messages. Again, that number is 703-420-3472. Thank you for listening today, and I hope you enjoy today's interview. Today's guest is Branch Isolé. Branch is an author, storyteller, and poet who writes about the strength of choice to change consequences. He is the author of 22 books and is known worldwide for contemporary short stories that reveal emotions and issues often experienced but not always voiced. He posts a thought for the day, which are different short stories and articles of interest, at www.branchisolé.com. Dot com and on his YouTube channel. This is a wonderful conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello, Branch. How are you doing today? Good morning, Sandy. It's good to be with good you. Good to see you again. <laughs> again. Yeah. All right. Hey, it's always great to talk to people a couple of times, right? <laughs> All right. Practice makes perfect, I think. There you go, for sure. So I want to hear about your story and how you got to this point in your life. And then we're going to talk about some of your books. Okay. That sounds good. Um, I was thinking about this this morning, and the easiest way to describe my life has been four separate adventures. Um, you know, the first 20 years was sort of the typical uh, school and uh, college. I was blessed that I was, I grew up in a military family. So I got to travel, you know, a lot and live in some different places. So <clears throat> that sort of colored my upbringing, um, being able to be part of different cultures in different parts of the world. So, so that first 20 years was a lot of travel, a lot of different kinds of people, you know, to come into your life, and then a lot of school. The next passing of time, I was in the corporate world. I was in sales and management and marketing and you know, did all of those kinds of climbing the ladder and striving for worldly success and possessions. So I was deeply <laughs> ingrained in in that corporate career path. 
And then I managed to basically destroy all that I had built. And so I spent the next several years kind of at rock bottom um, doing manual kinds of jobs and a lot of them um, <clears throat> getting into some trouble, uh, learning some lessons and, and basically starting over. And then in the last couple of decades, I've been writing and, you know, authorship. So um, those four general kind of reinventions or regrowth and rebirth is what I've experienced. And um, it's been quite a journey and quite a ride. Yeah, I, I, it sounds like it. So, so what happened? I mean, can you elaborate more on how you destroyed your, you know, your corporate life, your cor corporate career? Sure. Yeah, sure. I, I, I put my focus on my career, you know, and did everything I could to advance it. And a lot of those activities and pushing of the limits um, gave me confidence that I could do and get away with just about anything. You know, and in the, in the meantime, on that journey, I, I, I lost my family and then I subsequently lost my house. And, um, you know, just kind of spiraled out of control while at the same time telling myself that everything was okay and that I was fulfilling my desire to appear to the world, you know, the way I, I wanted to look on the outside. But on the inside, I was <clears throat> struggling and not very happy with myself. So, you know, I'm, I'm like a lot of people who go through that kind of an experience of being up high at the summit or close to the summit and losing sight of the things that, you know, truly are important at a base level that kind of define who we are as people. Um, you know, those two things were on divergent paths. And as a result, like a lot of people, you know, I, I struggled to a point where uh, my activities and my past sort of caught up with me, and, and I had to pay the price for that. And it was a dear price to pay. But you know. Yeah, <clears throat> sounds like it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, what, what would you tell someone who's kind of going through that now? in their, in their, you know, they're at the peak of their career. They think that, you know, they're invincible. Like what would, you, what would you, what lessons, I mean, obviously you, you lost it all, but, but what advice would you give to somebody that thinks that they're invincible and that thinks that they are, you know, have, have it all and, and whatever. Yeah, those, those are great questions, you know, and, and everybody has to determine for themselves where they are on their path and, and what that looks like. Um, my two cents for somebody would be, you know, you have to reflectively see, are you truly who you want to be? You know, are you living your life and are you presenting your life as sort of this <clears throat> facade, you know, or in Hollywood, they have these, um, you know, backdrops that are, that are only one layer thick, right? There's, there's no depth to them. It's only what the camera sees. So, you know, how valuable are the things that you're struggling for? I think it's interesting. A lot of people and a lot of wealthy people, you know, tend to find that this accumulation of, of things and possessions never seems to fill the heart. It, it never seems to really satisfy. Otherwise, we wouldn't be continually trying to get, you know, a bigger house, a newer car, you know newer or bigger of anything that we desire and covet. So at some point in our lives, we have to actually look in the mirror and say, you know, is this a person that I would want to be with? Um, you know, is this a person that has some meaning and some depth to them? And we have to re-examine our lives <clears throat> and our pursuits in terms of, 
you know, is this really what my happiness is about? You know, have I destroyed the relationships that I've held dear or claimed to held dear? You know, have I hurt the people that I claim to love? And if we ask ourselves some poignant and honest questions, sometimes we can see for ourselves, you know, the answers. Then the question becomes, you know, if I want to change, how do I make that change? Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't necessarily have even the courage to look at themselves, let alone even consider yeah, well, making a change. But I love that you said, are you, are you who you want to be? And that's so, that's such a, like a profound, you know, statement. And, and I always think about, I have a, I have a mentor that will say, she'll say, you know, when I reach the end of my life, do I want to look back and say, did I, you know, did I make my future self proud? Did I do everything that I really wanted to do in my life? You know, and, and it's like that thinking about your future self and, you know, is this how you want to be remembered? Is, you know, do you want to be on your deathbed with regrets? Should have done this, should have done that. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That, you know, that's it. When you look back and, and life goes faster, the older we get. And, and we come to a place in our lives where we actually realize, you know, we are mortal and, and this is going to come close. I've lived more of my life in the past than I'm going to live in the future. So, you know, have I done anything of merit? <clears throat> you know, have I given back? Has it been all about me the whole way? And, you know, this life is about relationships. And anybody who has destroyed or damaged someone else in their lives, in their relationships, can see the mistakes they made if they look hard yeah. enough. And, you know, that's a lot to contend with mentally when you've hurt somebody, you know, really in a deep way and, and have offended or transgressed someone and you realize, and then you have to say, okay, do I want to continue on that path? You know, do I want to continue being that person or do I want to, you know, be a, a different person, a new person? And you you said it before, you know, those are difficult things to to look at for all of us. We live in a world that encourages us, you know, to live with an attitude that it's all about me and I have to win at any cost, no matter what harm I, I produce. And, you know, it's, these are hard things to look at ourselves. We just don't want to, you know, confront our insecurities and say, I can change. How do I change? And what does that look like? And, and, you know, you're right, terrible to be on our deathbed, you know, and with our last thought, think, ah, oh, how much time did I waste? You know, how many um, inappropriate things that I, did I do that caused harm to others? And my point is, you know, we need to make that realization as soon in our life as we can. And even if we don't, you know, know how or 100% want to go in that different direction, we have to be able to consider it as an option. And in considering it, then we give ourselves another path to take. So we're not, you know, a prisoner of our own psyche and our own vision of ourselves. And I can't get out of this, so I might as well go, you know, full speed ahead and just burn out to the end. Um, those are tough choices that we all have to make. But at some point in our lives, we're all at that rock bottom place where we think, God, it's got to be a different way. or There's got to be a better way. Yeah. And I always say, you know, don't wait until you're at rock bottom. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Life is too short. So that's a good well, segue. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. You know, well, rock bottom, you know, you wonder why people get there and get out and then repeat the same kind of behavior that takes them right back there. Mm. You know, why do we sabotage ourselves 
and keep repeating that that damaging cycle. And it damages us. You know, we're the ones that are experiencing it, good, bad, or ugly. And yeah. and it's amazing how many people, you know, are afraid, like you said, are, are fearful of stepping out of that trap. Uh, you know, it's 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 interesting that pe- a lot of people are miserable in their own comfort zone. Yes. Even though they know the troubles that are coming down the road at some point, you know, it's just, um, it's a tough way to live your life. Well, and it's that comfort zone. That's exactly what it is. (laughs) You're comfortable in that misery. Yeah. So this is a good segue into talking about your books because you write about strength of choice to change consequences. And right. And I love that, let's see, you have contemporary short stories that reveal emotions and issues often experienced, but not always voiced. So talk a little bit about that, right. of your we, we, 22 books that you've written. Okay. <laughs> well, everything is everything that we do, or at least, you know, the big things in our lives become a choice or a decision that we have to make. And each one of those choices has a consequence. Um, I write about real life experiences and issues and emotions that practically every adult has experienced either firsthand or, you know, through a child or a partner or family member or somebody they know at work. I mean, the lessons that we live and learn are all fundamentally, you know, a handful of lessons. And we all go through those at different times in our life through different experiences. But each one of our choices is has an outcome or a consequence to it. And I try to talk about things that people know and experience that sometimes they're too hard to talk about, you know, mm-hmm. especially on the emotional and psyche level. You know, somebody who has been in an abusive situation, all they want to do is forget about it and get over it and, or deal with it. And, <clears throat> but they don't want to talk about it. So a lot of my stories, I talk about um, things that happen to people or can happen, especially in relationships that are hard to look at and discuss. By by writing about it, um, it allows the reader who may have experienced that particular experience um, an, an opportunity to look at it from the outside, even though they have direct knowledge of it. You know, sometimes it's hard to look in the mirror and talk about something, but it's easier to read about it as if it's happened to another character or another person, and yet you identify with those emotions and with the the hurt and the harm. Um, you know, the hardest way to get through anything like that is to refuse to look at it, to refuse to deal with it, because until we bring it to the forefront, it's just you know, in the back of our minds, kind of gnawing away. And um, that fear of looking at it, it gives it the power to continue to, you know, keep us entrapped in that experience. So those are the, not all of my stuff is morbid and and caustic, but I, I look at a lot of different life experiences and write about those experiences from both the male point of view and the female point of view, my protagonists are not all male. Um, I'm I'm focusing more on the experience and the emotional fallout and the um, rebirth from it than I am what the the gender of the character is. So, mm. uh, I, I look at a lot of things that people you know don't want to talk about or or are hard to talk about. So. Give me a couple examples of those topics that you believe are hard hard for people to look at or talk about. Um, family abuse, mm-hmm. uh, rape, yeah, suicide. 
Okay. Um, yeah, you know, uh, just lying, cheating, stealing, you know, those, the things that we do in our lives that cause harm, whether we had did them with intent or whether we were, you know, some kind of a victim of circumstance and we took advantage of a person or a situation. Um, you know, those are difficult things to deal with, even particularly if you've experienced them firsthand. And and yet, you know, as long as that fear of addressing them is there, then those memories have the power. And it makes it difficult to grow through it and, and realize, you know, um, I did live through it. Yes, it was harmful and hurtful, but I can move forward. I can move on. And, and it helps as a reader. It helps readers realize they're not the only ones who've ever experienced that particular situation. So there's a, a camaraderie in here's somebody else who went through what I went through and they got through it somehow. You know, let me discover how I can put it in my past. Yeah. And even though family abuse, rape, you know, big things like that. If you've experienced that yourself, even though on a logical level, you know that you're not the only person in the world that's ever experienced that. It's the the feeling of being so alone and, and you feel like you're the only one, right? Because it's it's you're keeping it inside and you feel like you're the only one, even though you know you're not the only one, but from an emotional standpoint, you you, you just feel alone. So that's really great that that you, well, it, you it, offer that. It 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 was your experience. Right. Right. So right. that's that's what you that's what you cling to is the fallout from it happening to you. Yeah, all all of the bad things that can possibly happen to us have happened throughout history. You know, since the beginning right. of of time and civilization, what we experience is not unique in and of itself, but you know, it has an effect on us in a particular way as part of our cumulative growth. You know, from childhood on, everything we go through and experience has that little input into making us who we are. You know, the point of my writing is to help and allow people to continue to grow and, you know, seek out the good things that are in their lives. And and the love and approval that we all need is there somewhere. You know, and as I said before, the hardest thing is to see people who continue to repeat inappropriate choices and behavior that cause them harm. And, and then beyond that is they don't find the strength to grow out of it. So they keep repeating that or beating themselves up about it. You know, that's a tough place to be. And yeah. it's about, it's about growth. If you can grow, then you can grow through it and move on from it. Um, you know, we all see motivational stories of people who were at rock bottom and came back in in wondrous and glorious ways you know through handicaps and whatever and the point is if they could do it you can too so you have to you know find the way that works for you that will give you that impetus and that thrust to grow and go forward yeah. that's what i hope the writing and the stories do is you know give them that spark that okay they did it. I can do it too. You know, how do I, how do I find that acceleration point? Yeah. Well, there's always someone that has it worse off than you do, no matter what. And, and I've, I've, yeah, I've brought this up a couple of times, but I always like to reiterate it because it was such a powerful lesson for me. One of my guests, um, the episode was, was released a few months ago, but um, in the episode is called the quirky quad. And I'm talking with this woman and I said, you know, she's a quadriplegic um, and became a quadriplegic mm. in her early, like early to mid thirties. And this was like this beautiful woman who just was, you know, 
living the life that you could never imagine. Like she would travel and, you know, lived in the Bahamas and just, just athletic and all of this stuff. And she ends up a quadriplegic. And I said to her, you know, you have to have points in your almost every day, I would imagine of like, why me? Why me? Right. And I said, what do you do? Like, how do you get out of that? How do you get out of that place of why me? And she goes, I talk to other quadriplegics who have it worse off than me. And it was like, wow. wow. Right. Because she has, you know, yeah. it's like, what other choice do you have? Right. But um, exactly. yeah. So you, you, in the information that you sent me, you said that you, you share informative steps to erect a framework that supports career, personal, and spiritual growth. What are some of those steps that you can share with the audience? Sure. Um, again, life is about relationships. So whether it's at home or at work or with ourselves and our spiritual growth, you know, we're always looking for and searching for steps that will give us more information so that we can be more successful in that part of our journey. Um, you know, I, I, it, when one of the things about corporate world is there's so much emphasis on teamwork, right? And if you're on, uh, on a team in the corporate world or the business world, then there's a lot of different personalities on that team. And it doesn't take long for those personalities to come to the forefront. So you know who the aggressive one is and you know who the, the meek or the, sh the shy one is and you know the skill sets and the strengths and weaknesses that other people soon exhibit in the group, right? And so that sort of defines the dynamics of the relationships in the group. And they're, they're always, the bigger the group, there seems to be more cliques and more people who gather together, you know, in numbers that are similar in their attributes and their traits. And then you've always got the overachievers, you know, who are trying to control and guide everything. So how do you make that team work, right? Well, the key to that kind of a situation, I believe, is in the leadership. And if you have strong leadership, they can recognize strengths and weaknesses and coordinate and manipulate those so that you keep the project moving forward. Um, if you have weak leadership, <clears throat> then it can be, you know, sort of chaos at all points. And how do you, as the individual, do your best and show your best and try and not get caught up in so much of the politics. Well, you have to continue to grow. You know, every one of us grows up with three basic desires. The first is love. We all want to be able to give and receive love. The second one is approval. You know, from our earliest days as an infant, we are seeking approval first from our parents and our siblings, you know, then from our peers, and then finally as adults from our world at large. So that that approval motivation is always a strong one all the way through life. And then finally, you know, we all have an agenda. And we are all in relationships where we are trying to push or garner space for our agenda so that we can make our mark and, you know, be a, a positive influence in what ultimately happens. And so if you have a group of people and they're all kind of, you know, on using these three tripod stands to hold up their picture of life, some of them are trying to grow and strengthen those three things, and some are trying to undermine those three things. So my focus and my emphasis is on the strengthening part. You know, again, it gets back to that self-reflection of who am I, who do I want to be, and who do I want the world to see me as? You know, there's 
a three stand also for our life picture. So for me, it's all about growth and how do, how do I impart and help people who come to me understand that and then discover, you know, these are my strengths and these are my weaknesses. So I will use my strengths and I will try to learn how to improve my weaknesses. And I will, you know, that will be who I am in, in the group or in my family unit or with my partner. You know, I'm blessed. I have a terrific partner and very early on, we realized that there's some things in our life, big decisions that have to be made that one of us has more information or more confidence than the other one. So we try to establish as much of a 50-50 balance as possible, knowing that it can never really be 50-50, but it can be 51-49. So when, when we're in a situation and it's an area I know my wife is stronger than I am, I just defer to her and say, you know, you know better than I do in this situation. I'm going to be your cheerleader. And, you know, we discuss it and we decide, but I leave it to her to determine <clears throat> what our choice will be. And then when it's reversed, you know, she's my biggest fan and cheerleader. And she gives me, you know, her input and then says, okay, you know, you've got to decide what our choice is going to look like. So, you know, that's my emphasis to try and help people to grow and go with your strengths and improve, you know, the things that you're not as strong in. But nothing is a negative. You know, I'm a firm believer in energy. And if you refuse to allow negative energy into your life, it will go somewhere else. You know, it's looking for a place to land. And because the universe is always in balance, there's just as much positive energy as there is negative energy. For sure. But in our world today, there's a lot of people who embrace the negative energy, you know, for whatever reason. So, you know, I just send mine to them and, and yep. they can deal with it. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it just it, it reduces the stress and the struggle and the conflict. And when you know what that looks like, you can keep it from entering your life. You just don't allow it in and it will go someplace else on its own. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yes. This has been such a great conversation, Branch, and we could we could go on for hours, but uh, we're going to start losing listeners if we keep going too far too long. So <laughs> is there anything else Not that you'd like to share with the audience? Where can they where can they find your books? All of that. Oh, sure. Easy. Just Google my name, Branch Isole, Branch Like a Tree, I S O L E. And I'm the only one on Google, so you won't have to go far down the page <laughs> list. It has links to my website, my YouTube channel, to books and reviews and comments from other people. So it's it's real easy. And I invite anybody to Check it out. I've got lots of free things to read on my website and my YouTube channel. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and keep writing those books. 